All right, thank you very much. Um, so I have a few slides, but they're not nearly as cool as the two talks that you just saw. So hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, so I, uh, the Center for Vaccines and Immunology is a new center on campus. We started in 2015. Uh, we're actually in the former small animal research hospital. They renovated that building. Um, so when this uh, facility opened and all the vet hospital moved out here, we took over that space. So I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, this is a pure infectious disease story and talk about a little bit about what our research is we're doing over in the CVI. Um, and as you guys are probably are aware and probably heard in the in the press, this is the 100th year uh, anniversary since the 1918, 1919 outbreak that occurred of influenza here. Uh, that was a global pandemic. I'm going to tell you a little story about that and how we relate it to what we're doing today here in 2019. So in 1918, um, the, really the first uh, major recorded pandemic in uh, really the modern era occurred 100 years ago. And there were 50 million people that died of this uh, uh, pandemic in uh, the winter of 1918 and 1919. And it actually lasted for almost 18 months. People think about it as being just during the, the winter months, but it actually went throughout the summer and then reemerged in the next winter of 1919. All right, this is uh, one of the biggest global infectious disease events that occurred in modern times. Um, that this many individuals actually died from infection, and of course there were billions more that were actually infected. And this was more people died than occurred at, during World War I, which was happening simultaneously. And so the two events, so World War I and, and the 1918 pandemic, are really interlinked, and I'm going to tell you a little about that. So as uh, the U.S. entered into the war in 19, uh, 1917, um, you can see these kind of posters were up, recruiting people to go over and fight in Europe. And what happened is that about that same time at military barracks throughout the United States, people started coming down with this pneumonia that was related to recruits that were happening, for example, uh, in Kansas and in New Jersey. And, and it was really associated with the, initially the military. And you can see here's an army hospital where there's so many beds that filled up with individuals that were um, in, uh, coming down with this uh, severe pneumonia. In the fall of 1918, it began to spread throughout the United States. This is an image of, of individuals, uh, mil, uh, police officers wearing masks in Boston. Healthcare workers were on the front lines of this uh, outbreak. So most, of, a lot of casualties occurred in uh, hospitals to nurses and doctors that were being exposed to uh, this type of pneumonia. You know, and this is long before we understood what a virus was, or really barely understood what a bacteria was 100 years ago. And so really people had a lot of fear and, and understanding about how this uh, particular plague was spreading around. And there was a lot of different types of techniques that were being used to protect themselves. In November of 1918, uh, the armistice was signed and uh, the military troops came home right in the middle of the uh, beginning of this outbreak in the fall of 1918. Uh, and so it really began to spread. This is a worldwide phenomena. Uh, there are just some examples of people, how they reacted in their daily life to this. Here's an example out in California where people were so afraid to be indoors, they started holding events outside, thinking it was safer to be outside than to be inside. There's a group getting their hair cut. Lectures like we're having now were actually being held outside at very, most universities because it was always associated with being indoors and people who seemed to be indoors in close contact were getting sick. And it became so bad in the, in the winter and fall of 1918 that they just ran out of hospital beds. And so people were just being housed in tents or just as you can see here out in the open. And this really led um, into the winter of 1919, where the mortality rate really began to spike. It, it spread globally, so that every part of the world was affected. There's, um, this is school children in Japan, people in Australia, in Russia, 
and of course in the heartland of the U.S. This is a picture of a person in Iowa. Um, this little girl is looking over her sister who's basically dying of pneumonia induced by influenza. It also uh, was occurring at the army hospitals in both the U.S. and Europe. And this is a, a real example of um, soldiers recovering from their wounds that occurred during the outbreak, uh, during the war, and looking at uh, showing them all in this movie theater, all wearing masks because pneumonia was spreading through the army hospitals. And really one tragic story to kind of bring up is an example here of, of U.S. soldiers that had um, survived the war. This was March of 1919. They were recovering from their wounds that they occurred in an in a England hospital. And the plague swept through that hospital and essentially killed almost every soldier that was recovering from. So they survived World War I, but they couldn't survive influenza. And they're buried here in this uh, uh, hospital graveyard still. So just to put in perspective, 50 million people were affected worldwide. Um, 10 to 20 percent of those infected died. So this was about 3 to 6 percent of the world population succumbed to this one event of influenza infection. In the U.S., this has been the largest uh, infectious disease mortality that we ever experienced. Um, and it all was related due to complications of influenza. So what I'd like to sh point out is, um, here's a graph uh, from um, just showing the top 10 causes of death in 1900 versus today. So we've made a lot of progress since 1918 about how we deal with infectious disease. And if you can see on here, you know, the bottom th uh, three are all infectious disease ages there in blue. And pneumonia and influenza accounted for a substantial number of those infections along with tuberculosis. Both of those are respiratory infections. And now if you look in 2010, you can barely see those blue lines. So we've done a, a very good job of, of, of protecting people, vaccinating people, having better infectious disease uh, measures. And, but other things are, of course, still leading <coughs> causes of death. Um, and this is another, just another example of how these infectious disease agents, we've really gotten a nice handle on them, but of the infectious disease agents that are still circulating and causing mortality each year, uh, those associated with influenza-related pneumonia are still at the top of all the infectious disease agents. When you look here on, in low socioeconomic incomes around the world, though, Lower respiratory infections associated with pneumonia are still one of the leading causes of death. So really in developing countries and uh, today, looks like the United States 100 years ago as far as what is causing the highest rates of mortality. So this still affects us today, as you guys all are aware, you hear about influenza uh, vaccinations and, and get your flu shots. And so each year, the, the various state departments of health collect information and send this over to the CDC, and they compile this on a weekly basis. And this is a public database, which you can look up if you like, called FluView. And this shows the number of incidents of influenza-related illnesses or positive specimens that have been reported each week from uh, starting here in starting of the 40th week of the year, which is usually about October, and it runs all the way through April, 20th week, and the next year. Because our influenza season is during the winter months from the fall to the early, late spring. And so this is just showing the number of incidents of cases that are occurring with various types of influenza, and it usually peaks uh, somewhere in January or February. So right now, we're usually in the heart of influenza uh, infection season, and so we always encourage people to get their flu shots so you're protected. But if you look at this historically, and this is over the last decade, influenza season kind of moves around during the, during the winter months. So sometimes it peaks in December, sometimes it peaks as late as February. The current season that we're in, 2018-2019, is right here in this red line. And you can see that we're still, it's following a trend of a couple of years ago. But it, we had a peak right before the Christmas holiday break. And now it's coming up again here in February. So, uh, people still get infected all the way until usually March or April. So, what are some of the basics about influenza? I've been talking about this in generics, but we um, want to give you some background. That influenza is a virus. Um, yeah, this is a, a depiction of this virus. 
It's a, it, one of the things that gives it a lot of its uniqueness is that it is a segmented genome. And so what's showing here on the left with all those different lines and the colors are representing the eight different gene segments. And like a deck of cards, influenza exchanges these different segments between other flu viruses. So it mixes and matches, and it's constantly making changes and updating, and therefore it's um, trying to escape our immune system. And so one reason why we have to have a different flu vaccine every season is because this virus is constantly evolving and changing. And so what we give you this year may not protect you against next year's versions of this virus. And so here's a schematic depiction of the virus in which it is, uh, its genome is encoded in this um, circular matrix, and it has these spike proteins on the outside of the virus. And immune responses, particularly antibodies, recognize these spikes. And so the virus is constantly changing these different spike molecules on the surface to evade our immune response. Okay, this is how influenza is transmitted. It's through respiratory droplets. People sneeze, they cough, it spreads in the air, they get it on their hands, they talk, they shake hands with someone, they touch their child's nose to wipe it clean, they end up touching money, they spread it around. These droplets, as long as they are in the air or on the, on the, uh, the object, the virus is still viable and alive. And so they can last from as long in the air as for a few minutes, and on um, objects they can last for 10 to 15 minutes before the droplet desiccates. And so it's very easy to spread influenza around. And this is why it's such a, 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 an easily virus that we all can get exposed to every single season. But I do want to point out that people talk about getting a little case of the flu. And there really is no such thing as a little case of the flu. Right? If, you have, if you're able to come into work, then you do not have influenza. You have a cold, which is caused by a rhinovirus or a coronavirus or an adenovirus. If you have influenza, not only do you have cough and, and runny nose, but you have general aches and pains, you have fatigue, you have a fever, and you don't want to get out of bed. And that is really the difference between influenza and a common cold. And so individuals, uh, when they're young and healthy, can uh, clear this virus in a couple of days, and they're back and they're up and moving around. But if you're elderly, you have real difficulty clearing this virus, and you oftentimes end up in the hospital. And so a lot of pneumonia sets in because individuals go to the hospital and they get exposed to secondary bacterial infections. So I'll talk about this in more detail, but the virus is not what's killing you. It's the fact that you're now susceptible to all sorts of other respiratory pathogens, particularly bacterial infections. So the faster you clear this virus out of your system, the more likely you're going to recover. There we go. So examples of complications of this. Influenza is exacerbated in individuals that have asthma or COPD, that either have sinus infections or they have bronchitis or pneumonia. It's also triggered by, um, it can have indirect effects based upon your, your condition of your uh, health, whether that's heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, these things exacerbate influenza uh, disease and infection and make it more difficult for you to recover. I just said it was transmitted by uh, respiratory droplets and the incubation period is for a few days. So you generally in an adult, you have uh, onset of symptoms about a day, uh, one day after being infected, and usually can clear it within a week or so. But the, if you're a very young child or an older person, it can take you over a week or more to clear this virus out of your system, just making it more likely that you're going to end up becoming infected with something else. So we call the attack rate. The attack rate of a child and an elderly person is identical. But a child usually clears this infection and recovers and the elderly have a much higher rate of mortality associated with this. Just talking about as we get older, our immune system becomes more immunocompromised, and we're not able to clear viral or bacterial infections as easily. But even for the individuals that are not directly affected by the virus or don't die from the virus infection, it is really a serious economic issue. You can see here that just outpatient visits alone on, related to influenza-related pneumonia, about 31 million Americans go to the hospital every year. 200,000 of those actually get admitted. And you can see we have somewhere between a few thousand and 50,000 people die from influenza in the U.S. on an annual basis. That is an economic burden, just taking care of your grandparents, your children, taking off from work. It's an enormous economic burden 
on the United States annually. So as I said, the most vulnerable population are those who are over the age of 65. They suffer disproportionately to influenza-related morbidity and mortality. Of the hospitalizations, 63% of the people who go to hospitalize are elderly, and 90% of the people who die from influenza over the age of 65. That's why we target flu vaccines for the elderly. That's why they're the first people every year to be offered the flu vaccine compared to young adults, because that population is the most likely to have the most severe complications and mortality. This is exacerbated, and you can see here in these graphs here, by having heart disease or other related diseases, the, the, the odds of, of dying from influenza go up. It also affects the quality of life. Um, being able to be a functioning person in society, you're more likely to, to uh, have negative effects on your functional status if you're associated with pneumonia and influenza uh, every year. Here's another way to kind of look at the benefits of how we vaccinate people. So you're offered the influenza vaccine on an annual basis. And so by the number of people who get vaccinated um, saves uh, 7.2 million annually of people um, uh, preventing illness, uh, estimated number of people who will um, survive uh, so medical associated events, and just the number of people who get hospitalized by getting vaccinated each year is pretty dramatic. So getting a vaccine even if it's not the best vaccine on the, that we have at that particular year, still reduces the amount of mortality and morbidity um, uh, in the society. So the VE listed there, that's called vaccine effectiveness, and that particular season was 50%. So even 50% of effectiveness of the vaccine still reduces this number of hospitalizations and, and, and mortality. So, my lab is trying to come up with a better vaccine strategy. So that effectiveness will go up. So I'm gonna tell you just a little brief science story. Oops. So what is the biggest problem with influenza is that it constantly keeps changing. And this graphic here is showing for the last 30 years or so, how many times the components in the vaccine had to be changed. So there are three different components that go into the vaccine each season. There's an, what's called an H1N1, an H3N2, and an influenza B. So how these are described, just a little nomenclature. On the surface of the virus, there are those two spike proteins. One's called hemagglutinin and one's called neuraminidase. We were just shorten those down to H and N. So there's a whole bunch of different types of H and N spikes that can go on different flu viruses. And so the ones that most likely affect humans are of these types, H1 and H, uh, H1N1 or H3N2 represent the influenza A um, viruses, and then there's also an influenza B component. And so as you can see, each of these different lines show how many years we were able to keep that component in the vaccine. So almost every single year, one of the components of the vaccine is changing. And that's because the virus is constantly evolving, trying to get away from our immune system. So there's now a lot of uh, information in the press talking about universal influenza vaccines. That is just a, a, a shorthand to say we need a better influenza vaccine to protect against all different strains of influenza that circulate. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you can look at trying to protect against an annual basis or you can do this over multi years. And so this graphic here is showing that you can look at single seasons and try and get what we call breadth of protection on the X axis. You're looking to protect against all different strains, but to have a real universal vaccine, it's gotta last more than one season. So we're trying to look at the duration of that immune response and make it last longer. The holy grail would be to have a single vaccine that you get vaccinated once and it lasts a lifetime. We're probably still 50 to 60 or more years away from having that. So just improving from an annual vaccine into a multi-seasonal annual, uh, sorry, decade-like vaccine is really what the goal is of these universal approaches. So without going into too much science, the HA molecule, which is depicted in the upper left corner, is the target molecule for most of influenza's uh, vaccine approaches. And you can, there's been shown that you can make antibodies against all these different versions of influenza, shown here. All these different H's represent all the different types of hemagglutinin that are found on the surface of these molecules. And we have known examples of broadly reactive antibodies in people's bodies that will protect against all these different strains. The, question, the real problem is, is that it's the abundancy of these antibodies in your blood. 
and often they're very, very rare. So what we're trying to do is have a vaccine that will elicit, a, make it the dominant number of antibodies in your bloodstream so it protects you against all these different strains. These uh, molecules can be delivered in a whole variety of different platforms. Right now we give you a needle injection of the influenza virus uh, that has been killed annually, but now we're getting away from that. We're starting to get into cell-based vaccines, genetic vaccines, delivering them in nanoparticles, which is sort of like studying them on the surface of a particle and delivering them to you. And these will get us away from the idea of using um, uh, more complicated measures for, develop, uh, for delivering the vaccines. So our laboratory is using a computational method to basically determine what are the most important regions of the influenza virus to include in the vaccine on an annual basis. And we've been administering this to a variety of different uh, small animal models. And in doing so, we can show that we get a huge breadth of protection. And I'm just going to show you a couple examples. Uh, we worked with the USDA right down the road to come up with a vaccine that would initially would protect against avian species of influenza. And the example here is that we vaccinated these animals uh, twice with our vaccine. And we actually are showing here that our vaccine is shown here in the orange. And the current vaccine on the market is right here. So this is looking at more mortality uh, following challenge with a high path avian influenza strain. And we protected against 80% of those animals against uh, death, whereas the current vaccine protected against zero. So it tells you that we've really dramatically improved this. You can see this on a, uh, on a tissue basis. This is uh, actually looking at um, non-human primates that were vaccinated with our vaccine. And then we took slices of their lung tissue to look after challenge whether or not they were protected. And here's an example of an uninfected lung. Now, Lungs under the microscope look like sponges, so they have lots of open areas because we want to breathe. But when your lungs become filled with pneumonia, they fill up with all of these cells and other bacterial infections, and you have really difficult breathing. So you know all that gunk you feel in your lungs when you're sick? That's what that is. So when you compare the current standard of care vaccine to our vaccine, you can just see that the airways are more open and protected. So this is against high path flu, which is usually affects most uh, zoonotic species. But what about human seasonal flu? So H1N1 here is an example. We used our vaccine and we tested it against strains from 1934 all the way to 2009. And this is looking at protective antibody titers. And what I'd like to show you is that compared to the standard of care, our vaccine was able to cover 30 years of protected. We would, you would have not had to change the vaccine for the last 30 years if you used our vaccine versus the ones that were on the market. You can see this again in a model where we use ferrets as our model in which people are, which the animals were pre-immune to one strain. If you vaccinate them with the current standard of care, this gray line is this, what's considered the threshold of protection. And you can see they protect against some of the strains in our panel, but not all of them. Whereas our vaccine basically protected against every single strain in that panel. The one might ask, well, how does this relate to humans? So we take our animal model and we look back on human sera of people who were actually exposed to influenza, and really the lines really overlap each other almost exactly, showing that what we can translate from our animal models into people, we predict that this would be protective again in humans. We've done this for another subtype called H3 and 2, and I know this is a lot of busyness on the graph, but what I'd like to show you is a bunch of viruses from 2004 to 2009 were selected. These were the actual vaccine strains that were selected for those seasons. And anywhere where you see a colored mark, that meant that the, the vaccine elicited an antibody response that would protect you against that particular strain. And you can see that, you know, the, the current vaccine does somewhat okay. It protects against a lot of these different viruses. But any of them that have a, t a, a number less than 10 really did not protect you at all. Compare that to three of the four of our candidate vaccines, they protected against really almost every virus in the panel. So you could have kept this, our vaccine on the market from 2004 to 2009 without ever changing it and still protect everyone against every strain that was circulating at that time. All right, so just quick conclusions. Um, we've been able to demonstrate now and published on that we have uh, protected against three different subtypes of influenza, and we can still continue to do other subtypes of influenza in the lab to expand this.
Uh, we're working with a large pharmaceutical partner now to put this into the clinic and actually determine how well it works in people to protect them against real circulating influenza. And those studies should come out later this year. So thank you very much for your time. Hopefully I gave you something to think about. <laughs>